Hi, everybody. It is week four, and we are going to start talking about ionic bonding. This is a beautiful picture of table salt, plain old ordinary salt you put on french fries, and the crystals that are grown of sodium chloride. A beautiful picture of showing the structure of salt. Here's the story so far. We've been talking about the periodic table and we have been talking about trends along that periodic table. Metals get more reactive as you go down and to the left and non-metals get more reactive as you go up and to the right. So we end up with the most reactive non-metal is fluorine, the most reactive metal as francium. And then there's this wacky group of noble gases over here that have almost no reactions. Well, in the early 1900s, chemists were piecing this picture together, and they had these reactivity trends in the back of their mind, and they started asking some really important questions. Why do some chemical reactions happen and some do not? So let's take a look at three chemical reactions. If you take sodium, sodium from group one, the alkali metals, the most reactive metal family, if you take sodium and you put it in water, if you take a big enough chunk of it, it will be an explosive violent reaction. So much heat is released, it's very exothermic and it can explode all over the place. If you take magnesium from the alkali earth metals, group two, it will react with water much more slowly. You can increase the speed of the reaction by adding a little heat to it, but slowly over time, you can make it react and it will produce magnesium hydroxide, which is basically milk of magnesia produced the, the slow way. By the time you get to the transition metals in the middle of the periodic table and you get to the far right side of the transition metals, you are getting to things that are less reactive and you get to the coinage metals, here you find gold. Now, if you take gold and get it near water, it basically has no reaction. This is why we wear gold jewelry, so we can take a bath in it and wash dishes in our gold rings and it's not gonna react. This is a picture of the mask of Agamemnon. Um, this artifact was found in the late 1800s. We believe it was created about 3,500 years ago and it has been sitting in the ground for over 3,500 years, exposed to a lot of dirt and water, and it did not corrode, did not rust, did not change. And that's because gold is very non-reactive. So the big question is why? Why is sodium over here so reactive, magnesium less, and by the time you get over here, it just doesn't react at all? That's a huge monster question. Well, we've got some hints to to get us to that answer, and we're going to come up with that answer in a few minutes, but let me lead you down that trail. By 1913, the great chemist Niels Bohr had figured out that there are places that electrons can be and places that electrons cannot be around an atom. These are called energy levels or shells. So you've got the nucleus, and then each energy level is a place where electrons can exist, but they cannot exist in between. Think of it as climbing stairs. You can have your foot on a step or on a step, but you can only be between steps for an instant as you are stepping. It's not a place you can hang out. You can't hover between, between steps unless you're Iron Man or something like that. But you are going to be on a step or on a step, and you can be there for a moment as you transition. Electrons are the same way. An electron can exist here or here or here, and they can jump from energy level to energy level, but they cannot comfortably exist on the space in between those energy levels. Well, a hint about those energy levels is buried in the periodic table. Remember, there are two ways of numbering the group numbers. There's the modern system, 1, 2, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. But when I had to renumber the periodic table, I said, don't eliminate the old-fashioned numbering systems of 1A, 2A, and I had to change these two A's. 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A. The old-fashioned numbering systems corresponds to the number of electrons in the outermost 
electron energy level for each family. So if you want to write this at the top of your periodic table columns, please do, but we are going to add extra things. I'm going to ask you to write more things after this at the top of the columns. So write these, but leave some space, okay? So for group one, there is one outer electron. Group two has two outer electrons, and we're going to ignore the transition metals for the moment. Group 13, 3A, has three outer electrons. 4A has four outer electrons. 5A, five outer electrons. 6A, six outer electrons. 7A has seven outer electrons, and 8A has eight outer electrons. So these outer electrons are part of that key to determining why atoms react and do not react. In 1916, the great American chemist Gilbert Lewis came with, up with the next part of this story. He asked, why are the noble gases inert? Why does this family right here not react? And yet, the halogens and the alkali metals are the most reactive family. The ones cuddled next to the noble gases are most reactive. And I've seen people take their periodic table and, and take it and kind of scroll it up into a, like a little tube. And if you do this, the you can take the alkali metals, and I'm going to just kind of sketch it here. You don't have to sketch it there. But you can place the alkali metals right here. Sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. And if you do that, these two very reactive families are cuddled up really close to the noble gases. So this family is stable, and the two families on either side of it are very unstable. So what's going on? Here's what Gilbert Lewis figured out. He figured out that the noble gases all have eight outer electrons. And he determined that that eight outer electron configuration is what makes atoms stable. And he came up with something that we refer to as the octet rule. The octet rule says that atoms bond to achieve eight outer electrons. And that eight outer electrons situation is stable in nature. Now, please understand, ladies and gentlemen, this rule is not something that mankind made. This is the way nature is constructed, and we uncovered it. Now, eight outer electrons works for vast majority of the periodic table, but there are some elements that are tiny, and the smallest elements on the periodic table don't follow the octet rule, they follow the duet rule. Duet meaning two. If you have two people singing together, it's called a duet. So who follows the duet rule, meaning that they are stable with two outer electrons, and those are going to be the tiny elements of hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron can kind of go both directions in octet or duet, depending upon how it's bonded. But this octet rule is a big idea. See, I put a big sign there that said big idea because I want to make sure you understand this. Why do chemical reactions happen? Reactions happen because atoms are bonding to form full outer energy levels. That's going to be eight or two outer electrons. And there are two ways that this can happen. Either by gaining or losing electrons. And if that happens, it's called ionic bonding or by sharing pairs of electrons, and that's called covalent bonding. So we're going to spend most of the rest of this week talking about ionic bonding, because ionic bonding is, I want you to learn how to ionically bond, and then next week we're going to get more into covalent bonding. So make sure you put a big star by this slide. Big idea, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.